Welcome to a new life with Woody. So we got Jay Williams, Let's Live Life. My homeboy, my brother, he's in the building today. Well, he's not in the building, actually. What's up, my guy? How you doing? I'm good, man. I'm blessed. Um, happy to be on here. It's always an honor, man. We go way back. You know, we, we've had our, our days, had our fun, I guess you could call it. You know what I mean? We got history. So it's yeah. always a blessing anytime we can link up, man. Well, that's what's up, man. Nice fitted hat you got right there, man. What's up with that? Uh, I got one or two, you know. Like that. I like the hats, man. When you go bald, you run out of ideas for hairstyles. So this is these are my hairstyles, man. Yeah, that's what's this up. This is my fresh. This is my fresh fade. Yeah, man. So what's up with Jay today, man? What's Jay doing today, man? Like today, today, or in just today's world? general you know you may have some people say where's jay at i haven't seen him in a while what's up with you um man i'm a full-time father man like I i'm blessed to you know i put myself in a position now where i can be home more and when i say home more like i no longer do the construction mm -hmm. i did that for almost a decade and being a company owner a business owner it took me away from my family a lot you know, there were in the beginning, it was 60, 70, 80 hour weeks somewhere, sometimes up was over 100. You know, I leave before sun comes up and a lot of nights I wouldn't get home to 12, 1, 2 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. And, you know, being the boss, you're the first day and the last to leave. Mm -hmm. So um, after this, this my last situation I had, you know, my little bump in the road, I told myself when I, I said, when I get home, man, um, I want to get closer to the family. You know, I've built something with social media and YouTube and all that I got going on. I'm blessed, man. I'm in a position to where I don't have to. And I said this years ago, I'm like, I don't know why I'm still out here swinging this hammer. Mm -hmm. I'm making great money with construction, but I, I'm doing really well with social media. I should take this full time. God does things and you don't always know why he does them. You just have to trust the plan, right? I was pulled away from construction and it gave me time to think. You know, was what I was doing there. I'm looking at it like I'm feeding my family, but in reality, I've got a way to feed my family. I should be embracing this and spending time with my family. Exactly. So now that's what I'm doing. Um, I'm up early every single morning, man. I get my son, he wants to take the morning showers, get him dressed, you know, and feed him, feed the little girl. For y'all that don't know, I have an adopted daughter. Um, she's been with us for a while now. She just turned five, so she's not in school yet, but my son is. So First thing in the morning, it's boom, we're in the car, me, her, and him. I take mm -hmm. him to school. That is a 45-minute trip. It's a 45-minute drive to his school every morning. With the, he goes to a private school. With the private schools, they don't send the bus around. You have to take your kid there. Yeah. So it's 45 minutes there in the morning. 45 minutes you know, on the way back. We might stop for breakfast. Um, and then I've got, her name's Bella. I've got a little Bella throughout the day. And then in Be the evening. Beautiful little girl. Awesome. Amazing. She's tiny. You know what I mean? We call her Toot, Tootie. And then it's 45 minutes in the evening, then 45 minutes back home. But in between that time, I'm here with her. I have to watch her. I can't mm -hmm. stop being a dad and say, hey, five-year-old, I'm going to go do YouTube. You know, don't eat that fork because she's going to be five. Exactly. So when people ask, you know, where you been? Where you been? I've been taking care of my priorities, man. I've been, I've been, getting close to you know not only the kids the wife man you know uh, construction took a lot away from me and my marriage you know it, it was a, it was a major strain at times so i've definitely focused on you know rekindling things not to say things went out but just making that fire burn hotter when it comes to my marriage and just being a better husband man being a better father that's where i've been at. well you know that's good because like i know like you spend a lot of time doing the things you love but youtube youtube brought you where you're at now you know mm -hmm. i thank you i have much gratitude for you for placing me in the position that i'm in now and uh you know today we're gonna dig a little deeper we're gonna talk about some things that some people may not know about jay mm -hmm. let's Better let's do it let's talk about jay when he was a kid what type of guy was Jay? What what did you do growing up? What led you in the path that you led that led you to where you're at now? Um, initially, man, I was a, I was a really <laughs> I was a troublesome kid, but I was really I was shy. I wouldn't say shy. I was withdrawn. 
for a lot of people that don't know, um, I was an abused child. I grew up in um, a very abusive household at the hands of my father. Like my first memories go back to, to child abuse. And, and with child abuse, you you stray. You know what I mean? You, you pull away from the household. You, you kind of become a recluse. I used to love to draw. That's where my tattooing come from. As a kid, I would escape reality by drawing. I'd always get in trouble in school because I, I wouldn't be listening to what the teacher was saying. I'd be sitting there drawing superheroes or drawing shootouts or houses on fire. Just just things that went on in my head. You know what I mean? Not no crazy movie stuff with like a kid with a knife and it says mom and dad. None of that. Just drawing. I would create superheroes that did this and that. But um, early on, man, I, I grew up and I would we were poor. I'm not going to say we were poor to the point that we were starved. Because my mom, and to this day, she was one of the hardest working women I'd ever met, hands down. My okay. dad would do his part. He was a tree climber, um, but he would go through jobs. You know what I mean? He was never anywhere long term. And then he got in these spells to where he wanted to do work on the side and for himself. So if he couldn't make X amount of dollars, he wasn't going to go. So then the responsibility would fall on my mom. We were that family that, you know, my mom did everything she could. So she sees this. I love you, mom. No disrespect. But we were that family that at Christmas time, the school helped with Christmas. Yeah. We sent in the list for jackets and shoes and clothes. And, you know, people would come to the house on Thanksgiving, food stamps. Um, we moved a lot, a lot. When I mean a lot, it was at times every year. It was like when the lease came up, we, we were gone. gone. So I never could. Right. I could never really make friends as a kid because no sooner than I made some friends, it would be time to say goodbye. We're moving again. Yeah. Now, you know, I grew up in the 80s. Man. I'm an 80s baby born February 1980. Um, and it, it was a different time growing up back then. Way different from what this generation sees now. Like a, I would I would put any, you know, 16 year old from the 90s against any 16 year old this day. You know what I mean? Because we. We had it different. We learned different. We fought in the neighborhood. We had spats, things that kids don't have these days because they're inside. Exactly. It's very seldom you see a bunch of kids on bikes anymore. Um, I grew up in that area. Back to the abuse, man. I, my dad was an abused child. He grew up um, on an Indian reservation in Cherokee, North Carolina, right? Uh, Cherokee man. So I, I don't know what it is. I've always heard that hurt people hurt people and that, you know, abused people abused people and i can't really agree to that that was always kind of his excuse or what i heard but as an abused child I, my biggest thing was i was going to grow up and not be someone i've never spanked my kids and i know people are going to say oh you got to discipline them i do but i'm too smart i feel i'm too intelligent to have to teach my children with violence right mm -hmm. so the 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 abuse came for pretty much anything it could be he had a bad day he's an ex-con as well so oh. certain things would set him off. Noise in the house. Just being a kid. He did time in prison? Yeah, he had a um, second degree murder charge. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. Prior to me being born, he was up at the wall, Southampton. Like, you know, he did all that. He's he's an ex-con with, you know, a murder conviction. So just about he, to ask what state. Huh? Was, I was about to ask you what state that in. That was in yeah, here, here in Virginia, Old Spring Street. Like he did it here in Virginia back in the day. How to, you know, he caught a charge out of Richmond. So he brought a lot of his prison mentality home with him. Mm. Didn't like loudness. You know how loud prison is. Yeah. He didn't like lights. You know how bright prison is. There's always lights on. Never go off. Uh -huh. He wanted the house dark all the time. He wanted silence in the house. If he laid down and went to sleep, the children laid down and went to sleep. If he took a nap at two o'clock, everybody laid down. Wow. And this wasn't your typical, you know, spank you with a belt or something. Nah, you got hit with a fist. You got beaten to the floor. You got hit with whatever was around. I carried a lot of bruises as a child, you know. I had to lie going to school about what was going on. And then you got my mother who was terrified to death of this man. Yeah. You know, like she had tried to leave before and take us in the middle of the night. He would show up where we were thinking that there was a man there and kick the door in and have somebody waiting outside the window in case a man came out. And in reality, she's just trying to escape. And there was no one there. Wow. No, there was never anybody there. The, the, the thing we were, we weren't running to somebody. We were running from somebody. Yeah. Um, 
the the abuse at an early age was was really really bad and then as i started to get bigger it got worse you know what i mean i don't know if he just felt like he's bigger now he can take more i gotta hit him harder because you know he can't feel it and i was scared you know and then that led me to just every chance i got getting out the house running away um i turned to you generally as a child are going to hang out with kids you can relate to kids exactly. that you're like i'm not going to go hang out with book nerds and you know what i mean kids that do this and that and living in a in, in poor neighborhoods you're going to hang around kids that you know come from the same background so right. i found myself as a child gravitating towards kids that had alcoholic parents kids that had you know abuse in the household kids that had less mm. and you already know what that's going to lead to you got a bunch of you know neglected children that are already going through things up here that's home life is not good they're going to rebel they're going to get into trouble and we were those kids that I, I think back on it sometimes on like stealing as a child and breaking in houses as a kid this is before 10 years old wow. these are things kids wouldn't do mm. but for me the worst of what can happen to me is already at home mm. the worst possible consequence i can face is at home and so at an early age um it started i remember the first time i really like i'm not gonna say really got in trouble but when the teachers noticed that something was off and this was like first grade so, and we had show and tell so you're and you're seeing this well yeah my teacher contacted my mom um we were allowed to bring toys in for show and tell first grade right like six years old and i didn't have the best toys but i had toys and i mean i can't act like i just played with sticks and rocks but you know, we kept grab little stuff here from Kmart or the dollar store, whatever we could afford. I bring my toys in and this other kid comes in and he's shining. He's got like all the G.I. Joes, the King Cobras, like dude is killing it with the G.I. Joe game, right? I wanted those things so bad. Well, mm. we couldn't have them in class, so we had like a little cubby you could put them in and mm. had to stay there until it was time for show and tell. I waited till nobody was looking. Went over there, took all them G.I. Joes, shoved them in my socks, shoved them in my shoes. Well, I'm six, mm. right? Most six-year-olds aren't stealing like that. You might take a piece of candy out the store, but you're not stealing all these kids' toys. No. We get off for show and tell, and I'm talking, these things are hurting my ankles. They're poking me in the side of my feet. I got them everywhere hitting on me. It's like 10 of these G.I. Joes. Yeah. This kid's, my toys are missing. And the teacher asked everybody, anybody seen the G.I. Joes? You know, I'm not going to be like, yeah. I steal. I'm six. I took them. Mm. No, no, I haven't seen them. Well, at six years old, I'm not going to go the whole day without playing with these toys in class. Yeah. You know what I mean? I got King Cobra in my sock. I ain't never held one of these. <laughs> so it ain't long, man. She calls the principal and he tells us, gives us his speech on stealing. And I no, no, I, no, no, I'm acting crazy. Would somebody stealing? That's absurd. Why would you steal your G.I. Joe's? And it is. We go through our spill of showing our toys and stuff. It ain't 30 minutes later, they catch me underneath the desk. Right, y'all? Hi, y'all? Hi, y'all? Making them kick each other, playing with the G.I. Joes, right? They call my mom. Mm. Um, you need to get on top of this. You know what I mean? Like, we've not ever had any problem with stealing. And I wasn't a thief. I was, you know, just, uh, I would do whatever yeah. at that age. Wanted to be a kid. You just didn't have the means to do it. So um, my mom talked to me about it. And I was like, okay, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. I was going to give them back. You know, I was playing. I made up all these stories. Got my little ass whooped. Well, we fast forward like a few months. And there's a, and it was something about toys, man. I don't know if it's the lack of not having, wanting more. But there was a kid in my neighborhood that had a bunch of Transformers. And he had them in a box. We lived in a trailer park. And I played out in his yard with him that day. And um, he's like, all right, I'm going to take my Transformers in. So I go in his house with him, in the trailer with him. And he lives in the back bedroom. And he sits the Transformers down in front of the window. And at that age, I already knew that I had to figure out a way to get these things. This is not normal thinking for a child. No. At six, I unlock his bedroom window. And I said, all right, I'm leaving. And I, I go outside and I walk down the street and I come back and I'm peeking in the window. And I see there's nobody in there. I lift the window up. I climb in. I get the whole box. I climb back out and I close the window and I run home. At six? At six. Oh, good. Right hand of God. So I, I run home with this box of Transformers, right? I hide them. 
His, his mom, my mom asked me where I got them from. I tell her this kid up the streets, mom gave them to me. He got some new ones. So she gave me these. Mm -hmm. Sure enough, they show up at the house. Wow. Did you steal the transformers? And I'm like, I didn't take any transformers. My mom's like, Jay, bring that box out here. Bring the box out here. And I bring it out. And back then you get your ass whooped right in front of the people. You know what I mean? Ain't like today with that nine one one. Come here, let me whoop your ass in front of this lady, show her that you ain't gonna be stealing, boy. They might and, even let that's where I grew up at. Yeah. yeah. And from there, man, it it just escalated, man. And the beatings continued. You know, they were nonstop, they were terrifying, they hurt. Um, and everybody kind of knew something was wrong, but like I said. In those neighborhoods, it's mind your business. You go over telling somebody else what to do with their kid, you know what I mean? You get your ass beat. Everybody had their own problems. People saw it, but it was just like, we got our own issues, man. We don't care what goes on with your house. People would hear the yelling, my dad screaming, my mom and him fighting, and it's just, you know, trailers, you hear everything. The walls are paper thin. There's only usually about six, seven foot between that trailer and that trailer. So they're talking too loud. Their TV's too loud. You can hear it. Exactly. And from there, man, um, it, it just, like I said, it just got worse, man. It got worse. I started getting in more trouble and more trouble. And then um, I've talked about this briefly. I was, I want to say I was 10 and I was getting jumped by these kids in school, man. There was these three kids in, in my class. I don't actually, they weren't in my class. They were in another class. But when we went to lunch, any type of thing like that, that's when you had to use the bathroom. Mm -hmm. um, it's crazy to this. I told you I have a crazy memory. But to this day, it was these three black kids I used to get into it with because I was small, but I wouldn't back down. You know what I mean? The way I looked at it is you can't do nothing worse to me than what happens at my house. You can't hit me harder than that 230-pound man can. You mm. definitely, all three of y'all together, can't beat me worse than what I got last night and what I get on a daily. And I'm talking about closed fists to the face. Like, I was the poster child for abuse. So these kids get into this whatever thing to where they don't like me. You know what I mean? Um, we lived in a roundabout. They would come to my neighborhood and cause trouble. But when we went to school, that's when it was really bad. And I had a mouth on me. You know what I mean? I crack jokes all day and make people laugh at you and then get my ass kicked behind it and don't care, right? <coughs> <coughs> so they get into this phase to where they start jumping me and banking me. And I mean, when, that, when I'm telling you they're jumping me, like I would fight with them. But you got, I was a small child, man. So they would give me everything I got, but they would always get the best of me. And it would always happen when we went in the bathroom. Now, everybody used to be like, don't go in the bathroom. But I just, there was something in me. You're not going to, I'm not, not going in that bathroom. Because then it just makes me feel like a punk. Like, I can't, I, it's not in me to run away. I don't, I don't have nowhere to run to. Why, how am I going to run? I'll, I'll run forever. So I would go in that bathroom in school and they would jump me. My mom loved yard sales. That was one of the highlights of my childhood, right? Like on the weekends, back then in the 80s, man, um, early 90s, $20 out of yard sales shop. I could feel the car roll. Whole bunch of stuff. Like all types of stuff. Five dollars worth of toys at a yard sale. You might leave like this. So we're at this yard sale, and this was um after that Rambo movie it came out, and Rambo had that big knife with the compass on the bottom. Yeah, that unscrewed. Hook and the the saw. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It had the stone on the side of it and matches in it and all. It was the whole big Rambo knife. Yeah, thing was huge. Like crocodile Dundee. Like that's not a knife. That's a knife. Like big ass knife. So I see it on the table and we've got woods all around the trailer park. We build clubhouses and stuff. And um, so I wanted this knife. I didn't know at the time why I wanted it. I didn't know if it was because of the movie or because I'm just a little boy, but I want this big ass knife. Well, I'm not buying you that knife. Put that knife down. I'm going to buy me the knife, buy me the knife. I'm not buying you that knife. Put it down. So she's talking to the lady about something else. I told y'all what I did as a kid. I take a knife, stick it in front of my pants, put my shirt back over it. Mm -hmm. Going to the car. We had an old wood panel station wagon. I go into the car, get in the car. I'm not looking suspicious at all, right? Look at art. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm in the car with this knife. My mom has no clue I've taken this knife, right? This was on the weekend, like a Saturday. Um, Monday rolls around, and it was crazy. I, I was good on the weekends, but I knew come Monday I was going to get jumped in school. This was an everyday thing. This had been happening. So now I got this abuse going on at home. School used to be the place I could go to escape the abuse. Now I'm getting jumped by these three kids, Cam, Cooter, and Rico in school. I take the knife with me. I put it in my backpack. And I'm thinking about it. All day long, it's in my backpack. I'm not six no more. I'm like 10 at this point. I've got this big knife in my backpack. I didn't know 
what my plan was. I didn't know what I was going to do. I just knew that they weren't things that, that as far as me getting jumped, it wasn't going to be like it usually is. This knife is too damn big for y'all to be jumping me. So they, they ring the bell. We go to lunch and I sit there at my desk and I push the knife down the front of my pants and I tighten my belt up. I hang my shirt over. I pick my backpack up. I head straight to the bathroom and they would wait down the hallway. And uh, then y'all caught me with the glasses on. They would wait down the hallway and wait till I went to the bathroom and follow in behind me. And when I went to the urinal, I would be like looking over my shoulder and I'd be trying to pee real quick, right? On this day, I didn't go pee. I just walked up to the urinal, I unclicked the sheath on the knife and pulled the knife up some so that I could pull it straight out. And I stood there with my hand on the knife. Next thing I know, I heard people coming in the bathroom. I'm looking, it's just other kids and I get shoved. And I turn around and they, there they are. That knife comes out. And I'm glad that, that it, it ended the way it ended and it didn't like, you know, it could have gone really bad had I hurt somebody. But I pulled the knife out and I was one of those kids that would get so mad I would start crying. Like if you saw tears come down my eyes, run. Yeah. Because what I was capable of in that moment, um, you know, I guess with the beatings at home, the stress, the emotional stress, it wasn't just physical. It was a lot of emotional and mental stress that comes from men that abuse children, like being called names and degraded and watching your mother be degraded and your siblings get hurt and degraded. There's a lot of mental and emotional trauma as well. I pull that knife out crying and I just start swinging. And they run out the bathroom. I chase out behind them with this knife. And I'm not, I'm not play pimping. You know what I mean? It just so happened that they weren't in my reach. I prematurely pulled the knife. I, and good. You know what I mean? I'm not going to say I should have waited long because if I waited a little longer and let them get closer, I'd have cut them. But I'm trying to cut these kids with this knife. I come running out the hallway and uh, the kids are running. Other kids are running out the bathroom. And here I am, this maybe 65, 70 pound kid, little blonde haired kid, shabby blonde hair with his big ass knife to the teachers. I haven't told no teachers about getting jumped. I was raised in a you don't tell them people household. You know, back then, if you told on somebody, you told on your brother, or sister, they got their ass whooped and then you got your ass whooped for telling on them. Exactly. So I'd never told the school about what was going on. So the first time they get wind of it, they see three kids running and they see a kid with a knife. Mm. I get picked, I get tackled Boom! by this big ass teacher. Knife slides across the floor. They get me up. Handcuffs go on. Like first they take me by my arm. At this point, let me rephrase that. At this point, we didn't have officers in the school. That came a few years later. But they gave me up. They take me to the office. They secured the knife. They got the knife. Cops come. Cops ask me what was going on. And even it's crazy. I know people are gonna call a cap. They're gonna say he's lying. At 10 years old, you were telling. I was upset. I was more afraid of going home and dealing with my dad than I were these police. Yeah, because you know who wouldn't be? That's common sense, man. Right. So um, I just played the stupid role. You know, what I mean, I, ju I just play quiet. I, I don't know. So now they're looking at me like you're crazy. Like, OK, so you just decided to cut three innocent kids today at school. And I just clammed up. You know, what I mean, I just went into a shell, like thinking that they're going to tell this. And then my dad's going to be like, you're a punk. Why are you letting these kids whoop on you like that? Like there's so much going through my young mind. And um, they put the handcuffs on me. They take me away. They end up releasing me to my parents. My parents come and get the knife. And it was um from there, man, it just um uh, I got more rebellious. The the crime became more of a thing. I started breaking in houses, breaking into cars. I had an uncle who was on the run at the time that um was stealing cars. Crack had hit and was really bad. And he was strung out really bad on crack. He was wanted for robbing some pool halls and some bars with a pump shotgun. And he had come, I had come to Richmond for the summer from Charlotte. And while I was here. He was stealing cars. That was his way of making money. So he would take me to the junkyard with him. And I don't know if it was just him being under the influence of the rock or him just wanting to sh like brag about what he could do. But as he was popping ignitions and doing different things, I'm just a kid, 10, 11 years old. You're he's watching. showing me. Well, he's not just watching, but he's telling me. You know what I mean? If you could pop this ignition out, there's a cog inside of there, put a screwdriver in there, click it forward, and you can shift the car. I don't even know how to drive yet, but I already know how to start a car without a key. So it went from all those situations I talked about to to breaking into houses. And from there, it went to stealing cars. And then the first time I even I drove a car or attempted to drive a car, I showed my friends I could hotwire it and didn't know what I was doing. It was a stick shift. I'd never seen him do one in a stick. And the car started rolling. 
and it rolled down the people's driveway and crashed into another car. And we just, you know, took off running. This is not normal behavior um, exactly. at that age. And I don't, I don't like to, to blame, you know, people say product of my environment. I, I think that that's, you can use that excuse up until a certain age. You know what I mean? Until you truly know right from wrong. But at that age, man, I, I just didn't care. You know, and then it, it got to a point where as I got bigger, um, I got tired of seeing my brothers and sisters take the beatings. I got really tired of it. So the beatings for me increased because I started taking blame for things that I didn't do. You know, my um, I'm going to share this, man. And I don't even like telling the story, but I'm just, I'm just going to share it because it, it played a major part in my childhood. You were the my oldest. Dad, I'm the oldest. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm the, I'm, I'm the whooping child. You know what I mean? Like the oldest usually gets it the worst, either the oldest or the youngest. My dad, out of all of us, like, I don't know what his grudge against me was. I mean, I thought the man hated me. You know what I mean? And I don't, it was just bad. But I remember a time um, he, had, he had got this KFC. He went and got this chicken, right? Now, mind you, this chicken, after we ate it, there was a little bit left. It sat in the fridge for like two days. It was just sitting there. And there was only like a breast and a wing or something left. My brother ate the chicken and threw the chicken in the trash. And my dad came in and was passing out about the chicken. I asked my brother, where's the chicken? He said, I didn't finish it all. I threw it in the trash. My dad's flipping. Where's the chicken? Where's the chicken? Where's the chicken? I come in and I tell him, I ate some of it and I threw it away. Did you eat it all? Uh, no, I, but I threw it in the trash. Go get it. Go get it. And my little brother, he's way smaller than me at this time. There's like a almost an eight-year gap, seven-year gap in between us and age. So my brother told me we had these black trash bags in the bag. I go and I find the bag and I rip it open and I bring it in. And at this point, it's got bugs on it. You know, there's bugs in the box. There's other trash that's leaked into the box. Eat the chicken. Who would do that? I'm a, I'm a child, you know. So I sat there and I eat this nasty, disgusting chicken. And I'm looking at my brother. My brother had this curly hair, these baby blue eyes. He was terrified. I don't know if he was more terrified than thinking my dad was going to find out it was him. I was going to beat him or he was terrified because he knew what was coming next. I'm eating this chicken. And I start gagging and my dad just picks me up by my throat, slams me in the floor and just commences to just beat me like a rag dog. I mean, there were times he would beat me to the point that I would cry and I would lose my breath and I would pray for him to just no longer be here. You know what I mean? I had all these plans. One day I'm going to run away from here and everything's going to get better. But I remember after that beating, my little brother walked up to me and he's like, I love you, Jay. Thank you. Our tears miles on that one, buddy. Man. And uh, it was bad. It was bad. And then throughout the years, there would be a lot more situations like that. You know, once I realized that we don't all have to, we don't all have to get beat. We don't all have to endure this. And I couldn't save them from all the beatings. You know, as much as I wanted to, I couldn't. But if I was there and I could, I did, you know, I would step up and I would take them, which looking back on it, I don't regret any of that. You know, it made me, it made me weathered. It, it toughened me up. Um, and look at the, the one good thing I can say, and I don't have much to say good about my dad. He's dead. He died in 97. And I don't want to, I don't want to bash the dead. They say all is forgiven in death. I don't know how true I feel about that, how good I feel about that, because it's supposed to be forgiven, but my memories are still there. The trauma is still there. The abuse still existed. He was a mean man. But the one thing that I try to always find the beauty in something, the positive in something. Mm -hmm. And the one thing he taught me was know what not to be. Exactly. That's what I took from growing up in that environment who I didn't want to be, what I didn't want to be in life, who I refused to be, who I would be as a dad. You know, everything I do is for my family. And I have, you've seen my house, you've seen my son's room. I, I make sure that my kids, their life in no way, shape or form resembles the life that, that I want to live. You know, they don't live in a hostile home. There's no yelling. There's no fighting. There's no abuse. There's no... You know, we're a loving household, man. I may look a certain way, but I'm not that way. Everything that I went through molded me 
and made me who I am today. You know, my dad would, there was no such thing. And I know everybody says it, but we, it was, there was really no such thing as losing a fight and coming home and saying, well, I lost, you know, yeah. that's not the outcome. That's not the outcome. I was put in the truck many times and taken back to fight kids that I was scared of. You know, like I was small, but when it boils down to it and I'm looking at this kid, my dad has already told me on the way there that if I embarrass him and I lose, that he's going to beat me. And I'm not talking about beat your ass, like beat you. And then you're going to fight again. I'll beat you in front of them. If the dad has something to say about it, I'll beat him. So you won't get there. You're going to whoop that kid. And if not, I'm going to whoop you and you're going to get out and you're going to try it again. So yeah. then they would put, they would put this fear in you of I've got to fight him. And when by any means necessary, or I've got to fight him. I know what he's going to do to you. I know what's going to happen to me. I'm already, by then, I'm, if I come home and I lost, I've already gotten a taste of what I'm going to get. I've already gotten beaten because I lost the fight. Yeah. So that would be it. He would take me up there, and there would be times where it would be crowds of kids, and it's just fight. And then he, he had these guys that, he, that worked with him on his, at the street company, and on Fridays, they would come to the house, and guys would smoke weed and drink beer and stuff. And um, a lot of times they had to wait for their checks. So they would go home and pick up their kids or pick up their kids from school. And I remember them betting on us, man. You got to think back in the 80s, early 90s, it's, it's, it's sick, man. I don't care when you attach the time to it, but they would bet on us. And my dad would pull out and I got 40 on my son right now. And my son's twice the size of your son. I got 40 on my son right now, and he ain't going to lose. And I would look at him, and then I would look at the other kid, and he would be like, wait a minute. You know what I mean? Like, and I learned to fight dirty. I'll bite you, scratch you, do whatever I got to do. And then I would get whooped for doing that. You know what I mean? And nobody tell you to bite. Use your fist. Use your fist. Get up. Get up. And they would like, like sit on the tailgate of these trucks, passing joints around, watching us fight. You know, that was my childhood. My, I was, I look back, I look at my son, right? And I watch him dribble the ball in the driveway. We go out there and we play basketball. We throw the football. Um, they go to their playground and they play. You know, and I, I love seeing them be kids. And a part of me, I'm living my childhood through them. I care. You know? yeah, like I, I watch them play and there's a kid inside of me that just wants to be small again and go play because I don't I never knew what it was to be that kid. I knew what it was to be terrified. I knew what it was to be hurt, scared, nervous not knowing what I was going to do next that was going to spark the next beating. So watching my kids grow up, man, it's, it's, it's a feeling I can't explain. You know, when I take my son to get a new pair of shoes, and to him it's just a normal thing. And my wife will ask me, she's like, he's six. Why are you buying these brand new shoes, these name brand shoes, all these Jordans and Nikes? And though I'm buying it for him, I sense I'm buying it for me. You know, I'm, I want him to be the kid that I wasn't. I'm not trying to buy his affection or buy his love. He knows his dad loves him. But I don't know where I might be five years from now, 10 years from now. So I want him to have those memories of having nice things. man. Exactly. You know, and then I get to a point where prior to moving to Virginia, man, the beatings got really, really bad. And they were always bad. But like I said, as I got bigger, the beatings got bigger. The hits were harder, you know what I mean? And they were longer, and it was more drawn out, more just brutal. And I had a great friend, man, in Henderson, North Carolina, Lincoln to North Carolina. Shout out to all my, you know, North Carolina people. But we lived out there, and I had a friend named Chad Overcash. And Chad, I hope you see this, man. If you ever do, reach out to me on Instagram, Jay Let's Live Life. But I had a friend in North Carolina named Chad Overcash. And we lived, you had to cut through the woods to get to my trailer. And then they lived on the other side in a house. And out there where we lived at, it was some trailers and some houses. So Chad was my buddy, man. His, his family was okay. I used to love staying the night at Chad's house. That's when I started watching like Halloween movies. And I'm like, that's where a lot of my love for horror movies come from, right? So um, they just had different things. They had different food, nicer furniture, and just his mom and dad were real loving. So I like staying over there. It was like, damn, this is... Like, just y'all got like the, the Wonder Years family. Like, y'all got that real family. 
So I played a different character when I went over there. You know, I smiled, like everything was good. And I was just a normal kid. Chad's my best friend. He knows what's going on. You know what I mean? He had been there. Jay, you all right? And I, yeah, I'm all right, man. You don't look all right, Jay. You look hurt. I'm all right. So Chad gets his dirt bike. <sighs> Chad gets his dirt bike for Christmas, right? Um, they look like a little YZ80. They flew, right? I tell him, I'm running away, man. You're leaving? I'm like, yeah, I can't I can't take the beatings no more, man. I don't want to go home. Like, I'm tired of it. You're leaving, I'm leaving. We're like Tom, you know, Huckleberry Finn and, and Tom Sawyer. You know what I mean? What the thick is thieves, Jay? If you're leaving, I'm leaving. I said, so what are we going to do? He's like, my, my parents, they got a big jar. They want a big clear containers. They got money. They've been saving up to go to the beach, right? So... I'm going to get that money. We're going to get on this dirt bike and wherever it takes us, it takes us. We're going. I said, all right. And so I go home. Nobody's there. I get this backpack. And at this point, I'm right at 12 years old. Man, this is everything led up to us and up coming to Virginia, man. So I go home. I get this backpack. Man, I don't know what I'm doing. I grab a shirt. You know what I mean? Just little stuff, stuff that's not made for survival. Just whatever I can think to shove in the backpack. I'm trying to get out of here before my mom and dad get home. And I run back to the woods, and Chad's got the dirt bike running. He's got a backpack. He put, like, snack cakes in it and Twinkies. And, like, we're going to be starving come tomorrow, right? <laughs> but we've got a couple hundred dollars that came out this jug. Some of it's, like, 20s, 10s, 5s, 1s, and a whole lot of change. So the backpack he's got on is, is real heavy. Yeah. Well, we get on this dirt bike, and I'd always heard the kids in school talking about the skating ring. I had never been. You know what I mean? Like, A, we didn't have the money for me to go. And B, who's going to take me? My, my dad ain't allowing that. So um, Chad's like, where are we going to go? Where are we going to go? So I said, head to the skating ring. How we get there? Well, I, I used to pass it on the bus. I'm like, go out here and make a right and just keep going straight and we'll see it. So first, we can't find the skating ring. So there's this little girl that's in my class, girl named Autumn Sharp. It's crazy how I remember these names, right? But we go to Autumn's house. I knew where Autumn lived. And she hears the dirt bike. She comes out the front door and she's like, what are y'all doing? My mom is going to be here soon. By now, it's like 3 o'clock, 3.30, right? And I'm like, I don't know. We're going to live in the woods beside your house. She's like, you're going to live in the woods? That was a plan, right? Yeah, we're yeah. going to hide the dirt bike, and we're going to build a little house in the forest right there. Like, we're going to put some branches up. I mean, I'm a kid. All right. She's like, well, we're going to the skating ring. I'm like, how do you get there? We tried to get there before we came here, right? She's like, well, it doesn't open to like 6. But she explains it to us. She explains it to Chad. He's driving the dirt bike. So it's getting dark. Her people are home. We push the dirt bike out the woods and we get on the main road. And uh, Chad's got a helmet on. I don't. So we get to go on. We take off. We get to the skating ring. We make it. We go in his backpack. We get some money out. We go inside. By now, we've been reported missing. His parents are, his parents are looking for him. Like they came home. We're not there. Uh, my parents are looking for me. We done ran away. So we're in the skating ring and we're hanging out. I'm having fun, man. And I, you know, I done ran away. I don't know. Chad's nervous. You know what I mean? Because he's got a good life at home. I'm having the time of my life. Like, I'm free. You know what I mean? Like, screw all that. Some kids come to us. Hey, the cops are in here. What? The cops are in here. They're looking for y'all. Where? And we look and we see them. So we go get our shoes and we take these roller skates off. We hit the back exit. No sooner we get on the dirt bike, we hear the cops. Hey, hey. Chad goes to stop. I tell him, go. Go, man. Don't stop. No, we got to go, man, go. Like, I don't want to go home. Like, I'm not, it's not so much I'm running from the cops. I'm running from my house. I'm running from my dad. I'm running from the abuse. You already know what's so, going to happen. Yeah, I know. Like, there's nothing, like, it's sad to say at that age, I, I didn't care if that dirt bike crashed. I didn't care if we ran into oncoming traffic. I didn't care if a car hit us. And it was shitty of me at that age to put this child in danger also. But I was a kid as well. And I tell him, go, just go, man. So he's driving. We're young. We're now in a high speed chase with the police behind us. And every time he would look back and say, I'm going to stop, I would shake him, just go, man. And he would go faster. Man, eventually they've got a cop up here waiting. And we're flying as fast as that YZ80 would go. We're getting it. This cop pulls out. We hit him. Boom. We fly over the hood of the car. We hit ground. I just remember tumbling. I got rocks in the side of my head. Chad's got a helmet on with a cop. Like, we got cars swerving off the road as we're flying by. And this took place 
I don't know how long, but it felt like forever at that age. I just remember going so fast and the wind hit me in the face and just, and don't, I'm not trying to promote this. I don't want children trying this at home. Don't do this. It's stupid. But I just remember the feeling of being free. You know, as crazy as that sounds, there's cops behind us, sirens going off, lights going off. We're in a full fledged chase at 12 and this wind is hitting me. And I just remember I wasn't worried. I wasn't scared. I just felt like this was right. Like I was getting as far away from because my biggest fear is they're going to catch me and take me back home. And you got to run away and I'm going to get this beaten. Exactly. We wreck. They grab Chad and they're trying to the cop is like so angry at this chase. This cop is he grabs Chad and he picks him up off the ground by his helmet. So his chin strap is underneath him and it's choking him. And he grabs him, boom, slams him on the ground. They take both both of us. The YZ80 is totaled, it's trashed. Um, I don't know how I think Chad's dad came and got it. They throw both of us in the back of a cop car, take us to the police station. My dad shows up, my mom shows up. Mm. Now I was expecting that he would be calm. You know what I mean? That he's going to come in and he's going to, but I should have known better. My dad was a nut. He was uh, just a straight noodle. He was off in his head. He comes in the police station spaz. Where the fuck is my son at? Like any cop that seen him come in like that should have known. We probably shouldn't get his child to this man. This man's a nut. Comes right in there and there. Hold on, we're talking to him. He talks over and he grabs me by my arm. My shirt lets me up off the ground. Come on. And drags me out the police station. Hey, cops didn't do nothing. Yeah, cops didn't do shit. You got to remember this is North Carolina, 1991, 92 time. He drags me out the police station. You got any questions? My mom stays in there and signs some paper, and he beat me on the way out the door. No sooner we get to the parking lot, the hitting and punching and gets me in the truck starts messing me up. So I told you he would make me fight. Like, I didn't have a say-so, but it got to a point to where the making me fight made me fight even when he wasn't there. So I've, I've got my sister, Elizabeth, at the time, and she's much smaller than me. She looked Puerto Rican, really tan skin, long black hair. And um, my dad had this friend, Joe Locklear, that lived up the hill from us. And Joe was like one of the biggest drug dealers out there. My dad and him were in cahoots, you know what I mean? Like that's what they would, that's how they were making money. Well, we get on the church bus and the church bus used to come around Sundays. Your parents are sending you to church because that's free babysitter. You know what I mean? When that church bus goes, go get your ass on that bus. You I ain't coming back. Wrote them too. <laughs> you know how it goes. Like it ain't about God. It's about I ain't got to see your ass to this evening. Go get on the bus. Yeah. Oh. <clears throat> so we get on the bus, and um, my sister had a mouth on her, man, and she gets to arguing with this kid Joe, right? And uh, Joe ends up putting hands on her. So I put hands on Joe. I start thumping him on Joe right on the church bus. Boom! 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 boom. So now I get I, I done beat up the pugs son, which is my dad's best friend. They knew each other since they were kids too. So we get we get home that evening. My dad goes up there and uh he's Joe's telling him, little Joe's telling him, yeah, we got to fighting on the bus and da da da. He was saying this and I was saying this. Well, he ends up throwing a rock. Like my dad whoops my ass in front of them and everything, right? Um, just to let him know, like kind of let his dad know, like I've got it under control. My son put his hands on your son, I'll beat his ass. So he beat me down in front of his dad, let little Joe stand there and watch. You taught me to do this. Now you're punishing me for it. Mm. What is this the same day? My sister is playing, and I was real protective of my siblings. Like you hurt one of them, I'm gonna hurt you way worse. Exactly. My sister is running, and Joe picks up a rock. And he acted like he didn't mean to hit her with it, but he picks up this rock and he throws it. And I watched him when he threw it. And it's like, in those moments, it, it feels like I tracked the rock with my eyes and watched it hit my sister. Boom. And Joe looks over at me. And this is, he's an Indian kid, but he looks Samoan. Good size kid, right? Like twice my size. He takes off running. And I hear my dad. It's like, it, it was like in those moments, I become that little pit bull. It don't look big, but that small one is the dangerous one. Mm. He hits my sister that rock and she lets out that cry. I take off my dad screaming, Jay, and I can hear him yelling my name. Now I've disregarded him. Now I've disrespected him in front of his homeboy. I just got my ass well for beating this kid up. This kid just hit my sister in the side of the head with a rock. Mm -hmm. And he's running. He's running, and I'm chasing after him. I catch him. Boom. We go to the ground. And in those, in those moments of fighting as a kid, I look back on it. I wasn't fighting them kids. I was fighting my dad. You know what I mean? When I would hit those kids and I would be throwing those punches, 
it was it was the kid was receiving it, but it was it was all meant for him. And I get on Joe and I just start wham, wham, just beating. You know what I mean? At, at a young age, I just punched this kid. And my dad by now was running down there with his dad. Stop, stop, stop. And I'm just hitting him. Wham, wham, giving him everything I got. And next thing I know, I just feel like everything leave. I get snatched up. Boom. He slams me on the ground and just starts giving me everything he gave his kid. Completely beats the fuck out of me. Beats me down, right? I get up, go to get up. I'm hurt. He's hurt me bad. Kicks me in my ass. Boom. Get to the house. I'll be there in a minute. We go to the house. I go to the house. He shows up at the house. The beating is brutal. It's a really bad beating, man. And um, so now there's a fallout. Now he's up falling out with his buddy that's the plug. You know what I mean? Because he's supposed to be a big shot. He's got the nice cars, the Cadillacs, and all this stuff out there. And for the second time, the small kid has done beat his kid up, made them get laughed at. Like it's, it doesn't seem like a big deal, but it is a big deal. I hurt his son. You know what I mean? And I guess I guess he felt like you need to get control of your child. Your child's out of control. No, I'm the animal you created. You know what I mean? They tell you don't be aggressive with them dogs because they'll bite. I was that aggressive dog. So now it gets into a thing where him and this dude fall out, man. And I, I talked about this in another story. Um, we're in the trailer one day, and all of a sudden, you hear a shot let off. Now, I told you, he lived at the top of the hill, and there's these woods. We're in the trailer and you hear a shot let off, <sighs> like a rifle shot, like you would hear from like a 30 out six or like a 303 British. You know that crack that comes with a rifle? We hear a I shot let off. <sighs> and then all of a sudden you hear another one. <sighs> like you can tell it's two different shooters because it's two calibers of bullets being fired. <sighs> like, so my dad takes off outside and they're shooting. This dude, and I had an uncle at the time named Bubba that's now dead, um, that was also in on them and what they were hustling with. The gunfire erupts. They're now shooting. Like, and I know there were some other things that took place in between this timeline with them going back and forth. And there were, I think there were some money issues, but this all just came to a head. So we had this old broke down Dodge. It was like an old truck that was the back of it was filled with trash with tall grass all around it. He runs out there and he's got all these rifles. He's gathered all these. My dad was a convicted felon, but that shit didn't mean nothing. The man kept an arsenal of guns. He goes running out to the side of the truck and he's laying guns upside his truck. Meanwhile, they're still shooting. He comes back in the house and tells, he tells me, grab this blanket, put anything you can put on it. Grab the clips, the bullets, uh, any guns you can lay on it and bring them out to the truck. I'm a little kid. So I take off running out the trailer door and they're firing. He's at the truck and they're firing at the truck. And I, I'm, I'm scared. He's, come on. And I run over there and I sit down beside the truck, beside the tire and I'm scared. And the truck getting hit with bullets. And he starts loading these guns up. A lot of them were loaded. He would come up over the hood of the truck and just <laughs> let off. They're continuing to shoot. He would drop a gun and it's, you know, put it in it, put it in it, put the bullets in it, put the bullets in it. And I don't know, I knew a good amount about guns at that age. I grew up around them. So I'm sitting there scared to death trying to load these magazines and shove shotgun shells in. And this gunfight ensued and took place for a while. And I guess what, what eventually happened is either they ran out of ammo or them shots was getting a little too close because he was just he was wetting the woods up to letting it off on them. Yeah. At this point now, we got to move. You know what I mean? It's yes. my mom. Yeah. It's my mom, dad, four kids in this trailer. There's a fucking gunfight in the middle of the daytime that all stemmed from this fight that took place. And then some other things sprinkled in on it. We've got to go, man. Like my dad's already a convicted murderer. He's already told my mom, like, I'm going to go up there and I'm going to kill them. I'm going to kill everybody in the house. Like, and he's not just talking about the adult. Like, he's going up there to wipe out the family tree. Do what's off in his head. And before all that happens, we pack up. We had this small little camper, man. It's like one of those ones you pull behind your car. It's like maybe 10 foot long. And a kitchen table folds into a bed. And it's like, it's very tiny. We load six of us into this camper and hook it to the back of the truck. And we leave North Carolina and we moved to South Side Richmond, right off Hall Street. Um, poor ass neighborhood. We went to my my uncle's house, my mom's brother, and we parked the camper in the backyard. And when I mean this thing is small, it's smaller than a prison cell. And there's six of us living in this thing. And that was that was it. Once I got here. <laughs> The rest was history, man. Once I got to Richmond, things things really turned up because I went from 
you know, the, we, we ended up living in trailer parks here in different places, but it was different. Richmond was way different to where I was living in North Carolina. It was uh, a lot more violent. Um, a lot more freedom when it came to the streets because everything's so close together. You know how Richmond is, there's buildings and everything's just there, opposed to being in North Carolina where you got to travel a distance. And um, at that point there, I think once I got to to Virginia, man, and I hit Richmond, that's when I kind of grew into who I was going to be. You know what I mean? Like my history was my history. It was behind me. I had a fresh start. The abuse was still there. You know what I mean? Nothing changes. It's not going anywhere. But once I got here, it was like kids didn't know that I'd been fighting. They didn't know who I was. So I had to go a little bit harder. But I fell into a crowd of kids that were just like me. You know what I mean? That were tough, that were rowdy, that were going to ride for me. Like this neighborhood we moved into, some of these kids I still, you know, some of these dudes I still talk to to this day. We became really, really close, man. But I was the exception. Like, I've got a buddy that gets out of jail soon, and he'll tell you, like, when I came to Richmond, the other kids, they weren't smoking weed like that yet. I showed up at 12 years old and, like, I could roll joints and all that. You know what I mean? Like, y'all trying to smoke. And they're like, what? You're smoking. Not a homegrown. Huh? Yeah, that North Carolina homegrown. Man, I mean, like, these kids, like, I was a bad influence on a lot of the kids. Like, I get here and my dad keeps weed so I could, it was easy to get weed because I could just pinch his sack. You know what I mean? Well, nothing to pinch a little bud and roll two joints out of it. So I'd, I'd start turning kids on and I was already into the girl stage at 12 years old had been into it much earlier than that. Like, I, I'm going to disrespect my wife, so I'm going to get into a lot of details. Right. But, you know, at 12 years old, I was already in, indulging with, with girls and stuff. So I brought a different spin to the neighborhood, man. And um, it didn't take long. Things turned up by 13, 14 years old, you know, chugging bottles of Mad Dog, you know, <laughs> Hey, that's, you know, the Mad Dog was always easily accessible. You could go in any store and right there it is. Boop, boop, boop. You we, know, drink two. We'd give, we'd give the guys on, on the side of the uh, corner store, like, right off the and tell them to go get us a, a 2020 and they keep the change. <laughs> you know? Yeah, no, nah, no, we wasn't. We ain't had a $20 bill. You know what I mean? We, we didn't have a $5 bill. We had free lunches and food stamps. Yeah. But, um, that was it, man. You know, then the detention center um, trip started. And once the detention center trip started, I'll be real, man. Once I realized, so this is what there is to be afraid of. Yeah. You know I mean, like, they, like this is the consequence. Like, getting locked up at a young age like that, it desensitizes you. When you remove the fear of consequences and repercussions out of somebody's life, then it kind of tears down a wall on what a child will and won't do. Yeah, you know, right. when, when the scariest thing that a child dealt with, he's already dealt with since the day he was born. And going to the detention center is kind of like, all right, well, I might have to fight a couple kids in here. But for the next few months, I ain't got to worry about my old man beating on me. Mm. Then it kind of removes the fear of getting caught. You know what I mean? If you uh, you would run. Of course, you'd run. Of course, the, the plan is to get away with it. But if I don't get away with it, who cares? You know what I mean? If I do get caught, who cares? And so I would do these detention center trips. And then when I came back, now I'm the bad boy. Now I've got this image I've got to live up to. Oh, Jay was locked up when you walk into school. It's, uh, he was in the detention center. You know how it goes. He was in the detention center. He was in the detention center. So now, even if I don't want to be this guy as a you child, have, you have to be you that. Got, I've got to walk in those shoes, man. And exactly. that's what it, I, I think what happened, Woody, was to be honest, one day I put on a mask. You know what I mean? To the world, to all the other kids, to become this person that I really wasn't. And I ended up wearing that mask all the way up until I went to prison. You know what I mean? That wasn't who I was. Behind that, I was somebody else. I don't mean in the physical form. I don't mean like a scary movie mask or a Halloween mask. I mean, I started acting like somebody I wasn't. I had to live up to this image of all the kids in the neighborhood. You know, and that's kind of really when I was born and when I say born, I mean, I was, I was reborn into not this, this greatest person, the attention center trips. I remember being half the size of the other kids, but it didn't matter. You know what I mean? They would bring you boxers. Well, actually they gave us these tidy whiteies. Tidy white. They weren't, they weren't just out buying new tidy whiteies. So if the ones they handed you had a hole in them, you had to wear them. You, you put them on. You didn't have your own soap. 
they had a bucket with pieces of soap in it. And you would go to the shower and you're a kid. You with other kids. It's not natural to be showering butt ball naked in a, in a shower room with other kids. It's like it's almost like preparation for prison and jail. Yeah. But you go in there and you reach down and you might have pubes, you might not, but that bar of soap's definitely got some pubes. It fell on the floor, the whole they gave us Man. the luxury and, and they gave you one squirt of liquid soap on your drag. That's all you got in you. Oh no, no, we didn't get and there was times there was times you might, you know, like I would get in trouble sometimes getting fights and I would be locked down and they wouldn't let me get the shower and because you're locked down, you don't get to shower with everybody else. And I come down, I'd be like, there ain't no soap. They'd be like, there's one right there beside the drink. Mm -hmm. So you look down and it's like, damn, you know, like you start getting treated inhumane. And I understand there's punishment, but at the same time, you're a child. You know, I remember my mom coming to see me and my brothers and sister coming with her. And my mom would be like, Jay, I really hope you're done with this. We love you. We miss you at the house. But all I could think is I know what's going on at that house. You know, I know what's waiting there. And as much as I wanted to go home, Part of me didn't. Part of me, I felt safer in here than I did at home. You're away from everything. You didn't have to deal with the daily nuances of your pops. And Dude, and I just, I got in so much trouble, man. And in school, I, I wanted to be that bad boy. I got into, you know, selling drugs at an early age and it escalated and escalated. And it just, it turned into... A lifestyle it turned into a life of crime my friends as they got older they were with it whatever i was down to do i had a group about five six dudes they were with it oh you, you got somebody buy some stolen cars come on let's go you got somebody that buys stolen tools i know a dude that's got thousands of dollars of brand new tools in his shed right now let's go yeah. like you know my first apartment i was uh 17 and then i turned 18 it was raided and i remember the cops taking all the audio equipment out of it and putting it into the back of vans. And remember that Ninja Turtle movie when they were like the warehouses and had everything stashed? The cop referenced that movie. He's like, this is like something about that Ninja Turtle movie. Like there were decks, like car stereos stacked. There were speaker boxes stacked. There were amps stacked. But I was already a criminal. I knew to pull the serial numbers off of everything so that it couldn't be traced. Back then they were etching. It was a little tag, a little piece of paper. So just peel that off, throw that in the trash. That place gets raided, you know? I lose that place. And and what he honestly from there, I started hitting Philadelphia a lot. Me and my homeboy Bri Bri's from Philly. And once I hit Philly, Philly was a whole new monster. Philly was a whole new animal. Like I stepped into the streets of Philly and it was like, all right, everybody's like me or meaner than me. Exactly. So now I gotta take who I am already and really turn up because I'm the kid from out of town. Mm -hmm. And I was I wasn't in Philly, maybe a week and i was locked up for robbery you know 19 years old sent away for robbery mm. hey so, so i think that's go ahead now i was gonna say let's 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 shift a little bit forward you know i mean you've gone deep and i want i, I really respect you for that because it's gonna it's gonna open up a different dynamic dynamic for other people to look at but I want to say something real quick before we go any further, man. All right, go ahead. Any kids, kids, women, um, mm -hmm. men, anybody that's watching this that is going through anything similar, that's going through abuse, there's nothing wrong with telling somebody what's going on. Exactly. I endured that for so many years. My brothers, my sisters, um, my mom, we endured that for so long because we didn't tell anybody. We were afraid of what would happen if we told, mm. tell somebody. Exactly. If somebody's putting their hands on you or they're hurting you, they need to be removed from your life. They need to be held accountable. You are a person and you deserve to be happy and not live in fear. Yeah, I appreciate that. So what you went through in your childhood leading up to the point where you're at now, what what is the biggest thing that you take away, take from, being your 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 old self, growing up the way you did, and utilize it to better yourself today. What what is it you do? I have a constant appreciation for it's it's not the big things. It's not the house. It's not the cars. It's the small things. You know what I mean? Like when you when you grow up with less, 
because you get used to not having less. I mean, you not you get used to not having the things that others have, but you also the things I think back to not having. When I think back about it, it's not the nice shoes, it's not the nice house, it's the family, family. it's the bond, it's the the love inside the household, it's the talk to child in at night, the never going to bed angry at your wife, kissing her every night, no matter what, and saying, that was stupid. I love you. What I took from all that is who I want to be and how to live life. You know, like, uh, we grew up the way we did. Um, and I, I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to blame my mom. She, she did everything she could for a woman. If you think we were scared, how scared do you think she was? Exactly. You know, because for we came along, she took the beatings. You know, and it was—I can only imagine what it did to her to have to sit by and watch and hold me at times as I would cry and just—I I love you and I'm sorry that he did that to you. All that shit made me the man that I am today. You know, some of it's good, some of it's bad. You know, I do have. I would be lying if I said that growing up with that man and my wife didn't put some sort of a demon in me. You know what I mean? Like when you when you're subjected to violence for that amount of time and at that early of an age, I'm talking about you're supposed to be learning ABCs and you're trying to think of a lie on what to tell other kids or your teacher about where this mark came from or, you know, your, your, your kids are going home and doing homework and you're worried about going home to to a beaten, those type of things really, once you grow into a man, make you appreciate life. But at the same time, like I go back to that dog analogy, once you teach a dog to fight, you can tell it to stop, you can rehome it, but there are going to be times that, that that dog's going to deal with something that's going to make him snap. You know, now I don't, I don't snap on the ones I love. Um, they know how I am. Like I've never been the guy in the house screaming, yelling. I don't, I don't do that. But if you come in the vicinity of mine and the ones I care about, mm -hmm. it goes back to me being a kid. I no longer care about me. I worry about them. And at all costs, I'm going to do what I have to, to protect them. Even if it means sacrificing myself, they will not fall victim to any type of harm or any type of violence as long as I'm here. And so, I owe that to the way I was raised. So I'm going to say this. Jay spoke on it. Um, on the screen, you're going to see some numbers. If you're going through any type of abuse, physical, mental, whatever you may be going through, call these numbers here. You know, reach out to somebody. Don't hold it in. It's not you're not snitching if you're telling on that aspect if you're getting abused or you see uh, someone else getting abused. So, you know, reach out to these people and uh, do your due diligence. Get out of the situation, you know. I don't believe, you know, my, my dad beat my mom the whole nine yards. I've been through it all, you know. I just don't talk about it. I thank you for opening up. It really, really brought emotions back to me of my childhood, the way that I was raised in alcoholic family and dealing with the beatings. And I've, I've been through that myself, you right. know share that with you. I share your pain, you know, and it really means a lot to me that you were able to open up and express the way that you feel. And I hope that it has released a little bit of pressure off your shoulders, you know, and to be able to speak about it because you did get emotional and I, I, I got emotional with you. You know, you, you struck some chords with me and I, I really appreciate that. That's much love, man. Well, you're my dude, man. You know, we're more alike than we are different. Like I, I, there's been more than one or two times that man, you've come nose to nose in the cell. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think the only thing that that separated you from my other cellmates and kept us from fighting is we built a friendship. Exactly. It's, you know, like it's different when you're in a cell with somebody and you just don't really rock with this dude and you don't care what happens after y'all fight, opposed to you're looking at your homeboy, somebody you've been been with for a while, and you know that at the moment you raise one of those and throw it. The friendship's over. But the times that we did get in get into situations, it was because we were locked in ourselves for two, three, four weeks at a time. 
yeah, it's cabin know? fever. And for people that, don't know, when you when you're locked up like that, and they like we would go on these long long shakedowns. Somebody would get stabbed, or they would find something, and they would put the whole institution on lock. Mm -hmm. So now me and him, we you got to sit in there every time I take a shit. You got to smell every one of them. I've got to smell mm -hmm. every one of yours. It'll get to the point where when you stay with somebody that long, just the way they chew their food. Mm -hmm. Something that doesn't even matter. Just the, the sound of them chewing their food will have you like, uh, or and it's not really them. Or it's those have, four walls. It's that room. Are you having to fix the stinger because I don't let that bitch burn up? You I'm know? like, what do you, what do you, what do you take those stingers? It pink. It, <laughs> it broke. I'm like, oh, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. But we made the best of it, man. There's a lot of nights we sat up. You know, would you leaned up against the door looking out for the guards? And I'd be tattooing all night long. Like, you know, it. And not tell people like it ain't like every day in prison was a party because it wasn't. But we drank a lot. You know what I mean? Oh, God. We yes. definitely. Yeah, I could. I could still I can remember what it smells like. And when you restrain it. But man, we drank. We drank a lot. That's one thing I did learn in prison how to make alcohol. Yeah, you did, man. But man, you know. I'm I'm happy for where you're at in your life right now. You know, I have a lot to I have a lot to, uh, to look up to in you. You know, people, you know, think that mistakes that people have define the person that they are. You know, we grow from our mistakes. As long as you take accountability for what you've done in your lifetime. Absolutely. I got, I got respect for you. Right. But I appreciate you coming on, man. Like we've uh talked about things, man. We'll have to uh together apart. So, I'm with it, man. I'm always here, you know, like the the best thing about this, Woody, is we can take our past and uh, take a negative and turn it into a positive. You know, I hope this video helps somebody, you know, from where I came from to where I'm at today. It mm -hmm. starts with wanting more and, and taking what you've been through and saying it stops here. You know, yeah. it's not life is when you're that age. Life is it's what you have to go through. But once you become a man. You can change that course. Exactly. You know, before the, this uh, live, I just want to thank you. You know, a lot of people know that you put me on YouTube, man. Like you gave me the 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 platform. You 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 helped me out starting out. And in that very house that you're at, my wife came up with my name, New Life with Woody. Right. And this is where this channel started at in that kitchen right there. And then the studio downstairs. But yep. I just had my first viral video, you know, mm -hmm. true indeed is not my video. My homeboy gave it to me, but you know, I did the editing on it. Contrary to what people think. But now, when you say he gave it to you, it was something that happened in his personal life. Yes. Like let people know that it was something that happened with him and his daughter. It did. His ring cam footage. You seen it was like, Oh, let me, let can me, I use this? Can I use that? And he right. said, absolutely. Um, and, you know, I've had flack, you know, some of the comments, people saying I stole it from TikTok, whatever the case may be. Look, I got my dude coming on an interview. He's going to explain. You remember the video. You remember the face. And uh, he's an ex-correctional officer. And I'm giving you all a sneak preview. He's going to give a juicy tell-all, all the corruption behind the scene, what it's like to be a CO. And he's about to give it raw and uncut right here on New Life with Woody. And uh, I'm looking forward to that. But what, what were you about to say? I've told you this before, man. You got to with with and you know this. You've been through it. You have to have thick skin with YouTube um, and social media in general because you open yourself up. But mm -hmm. remember this. Dude, no matter what you do, somebody's going to say something. You could walk on water tomorrow. You know what they're going to say? He only did that because he can't swim. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> it doesn't matter what you do. There's always going to be somebody that has something to say. You know what I mean? But the yeah. way I look at it is if they're not at your level or doing it better than you, mm -hmm. it really doesn't matter. Yeah. You no. Know? I appreciate you, my guy, man. This is the one and only Jay Williams. Let's live life. Life with Woody, man. I thank y'all for tuning in. Look, my saying that on my channel is much love, and let's always do this together, man. Much love, my guy. I'll holler at you soon, Salute. though. Salute, always. Man. Come on. You can hit stop recording. I already did. It's been it's ending recording.